Almighty God, King of the universe, we thank Thee, Father, for Thy great love, for Thy mercy, for Thy goodness. We thank You for Jesus and Him crucified. We thank You, Father, for this church and the opportunity to work and serve the poor. We pray, Father, for the poor and the homeless in this neighborhood, and we pray that we're able to serve them even more. And we pray for our young people and the youth uh, people that are moving back into this area that we'll be able to build a future church here. Father, we pray that you'll continue to bless our radio ministry that goes out to all the earth, and we thank you for it. We give you credit for it because we could never have done anything like this without you. We thank you, Father, for our internet uh, ministry, and we pray that you continue to protect our website from the hackers and from the people that's trying to shut us down. And thank you for all of the people that you send from worldwide to uh, our uh, uh, internet site. We thank you for the opportunity to feed the poor here and the 2,000 meals that we put out a week and all of the people that we feed and the homeless that we uh, feed and take care of and try to clothe. Father, we pray that you continue to have mercy upon us, bless us and help us with fruit, we pray thee. Forgive our sins. Help us to become more and more like Jesus. And in his name we pray. Amen. We'd like to ask our brother Eddie Frazier, our jail chaplain, to come and give us a report on the jail ministry. Tell us about it, Eddie. How's well, it going? It's still going great. You know, anything God has his hands in is always going to go great, if not absolutely marvelous. You know, I want to tell you about one incident that happened to our group some time ago, a couple years ago. They changed some rules and regulations, and one of our young men was supposed to not able to come in. I've been coming in for five years, and he wasn't going to be able to come back till 2020. But I went down to the chaplain uh, Monday, and I talked to both the chaplains down there, and for some reason, God has put him back on the list. And he's coming today two, two years earlier. And this young man, while he was uh, out of our ministry, kind of flew away and went a different way. And I called him the prodigal son, but he's now back, back in the Word of God. And this young man, while he was uh, out of circulation, he sent me a total of 240 Bibles that he paid for that we could take him to the prison. And he told me to keep it anonymous. That's why I'm not going to mention his name. But y'all just continue to pray for us that we can continue to grow in, in, in uh, God's will and, and get our number this year up to 20,000. Amen. Thank God you bless you. you. This man has uh, uh, began his ministry in the county jail and in the state prisons uh, in 1998. And he's baptized over 19,000 people since 1998 in the uh, county jails and the Texas prison system. And he's done that on no pay, and, and uh, he, he's an absolute all-volunteer. Everybody here is volunteers, and uh, with the exception of William, and he's almost volunteer. He, we don't pay him much, and, and so... Uh, I don't know how he lives on $250 a week. I, I, I don't think I could. We want to welcome our worldwide radio audience to the worship of the Main Street Church of Christ. We're an inner city all-volunteer congregation dedicated to preaching the gospel to the whole wide world and feeding the poor and the homeless. We uh, are going to attempt this morning to preach the gospel to the whole wide world. We begin, I'd like for you to put up that slide that we show the relationship between the synoptic gospels. And I'd like for you to notice that 76% of Mark is found and makes up 46% of Matthew and 41% of Luke. And they perfectly agree, although that they use different words. But I want you to notice that what you have to do is you've got to read all four because you can't read any one gospel and, and get the full picture. Matthew has 20% of it that's unique to Matthew that's not found in any other book. Matthew also has 24% of it, makes up 23% of Luke. But Luke also has 35% that's unique to it. Now if you'll notice that Mark has 3% of Mark is only found in Mark. And so uh, that's a very little that's only found in, in just Mark. And so after seeing that, now these Gospels were written early. Pappas tells us that uh, Matthew wrote his Gospel, and I believe that that's as uh, 
20% here that's unique to Matthew and this 24% here that's, that's uh, he wrote that in Aramaic before the year 37 and, and went on his first missionary journey. We've got a, 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 a papyrus of Matthew that uh, some leading scholars believe was written about 50 AD. So we've got copies of the New Testament that was written very early. And so Pappus, who's writing, he was taught by the Apostle John. He's writing about the year 110 or something like that. He says that John had copies of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and that the people in the church in Ephesus asked him to write his gospel. And that he said, well, I'll write things that's not included in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And so he does in the beginning of his gospel, and at the end of his gospel, but in the middle, he's got things, and especially about the Passion Week, about the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, he agrees with the synoptics uh, very closely. And so we're going to look at that this morning. If you'd open your Bibles with me to John chapter 1, we'll begin in verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Christ was pre-existent. The Word was pre-existent before creation, and He was there with God. All things were made by Him, by the spoken Word of God, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness here on earth, among the Jews specifically, and the darkness comprehended it not. So let's look at verse 1 again. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now drop down to verse 14. And the Word was made flesh, and dwelt or tabernacled among us. That same power that said, let there be light, that created everything, said, let Mary be pregnant with the power of the spoken Word of God, and so that's how Jesus became flesh and tabernacled among us. And we beheld his glory, his splendor, and the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The eternal God became flesh and tabernacled among men, lived the perfect sinless life, taught as no other man ever taught, worked miracles, signs, and wonders, and supernatural deeds, proving beyond a doubt that he was God in the flesh. Then freely as an innocent victim, he gave his life as a pure and perfect sacrifice for our sins and indeed for the sins of the world if they will only freely accept the pardon and come to God in the appointed way. If you turn with me now to John chapter 18, we'll begin to pick up in verse 12. John 18 verse 12. And then the band, and this is a portion of the band, not the whole band. A band is about a thousand Roman troops, and so this is probably a squad of the band. The band and the captain, and the word there is Chiliarch. That means that he's the head man, the head Roman in control under the governor. He's equivalent to about a brigadier general. He would be in charge of, a, of about a thousand men. And the captain and the officers of the Jews, these are the Levites and the temple guards, took Jesus and bound him and led him away to Annas. Now Annas had been high priest and he was uh, put away by Tiberius because he had killed a man, had a man killed, uh, and the Jews didn't have the right of capital punishment at that time. And so Tiberius took away his uh, title as high priest. And so Annas had sons and sons-in-law, and he had six sons and sons-in-law who served as high priest as, uh, uh, in his place and led him away to Annas first, for he was father-in-law to Caiaphas, which was high priest that same year. We have a picture we're going to put up of an ossuary, which is a bone box, in this ossuary, the Jews were digging a highway many years ago, and 
broke through into a grave and found this ossuary. Now, when the Jews buried you, they'd lay you out on a, on a, a rock bench and let you rot for the year. And at the end of the year, they'd take one of these ossuaries and they'd scoop your bones and dust into that ossuary. And guess what they found in that ossuary? They found Caiaphas had been coined in the mouth. Now that means that he believed in, in the mythology of the Greeks that he had to have a coin to present to the river, uh, the boat driver that took him across the boat into uh, the river of death into hell. Now Caiaphas, he wasn't even a believer, and if you notice at the end of that bone box, this says here in Hebrew, Yosef bar Kufu, and uh, Josephus tells us that that is his full proper name, Joseph, son of Caiaphas. Now Caiaphas was he that gave counsel to the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. He did this in John eleven forty eight and following. And Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did that other, another disciple, and that's how John refers to himself in this book. Instead of using his own name, he says another disciple, or that disciple whom Jesus loved, and so did another disciple, and that disciple was known unto the high priest, and went in with Jesus unto the palace of the high priest, into... Uh, and so his palace was an enormous palace in Jerusalem. We've got a, a picture of that that they'll put up for you here in a minute. Verse 16. And Peter stood at the door without, then went out that other disciple, John, which was known unto the high priest, and spake unto her that kept the door, and brought in Peter. Now you see from John we saw the mystery of the synoptics because we don't know from the synoptics, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we don't know how Peter got into the trial. But now we see how Peter got into the trial. John was known to the high priest's house. John probably was influential in that uh, city of Jerusalem, well known. And so John got him in. Verse 17. Then saith the damsel that kept the door unto Peter, Art not thou also one of this man's disciples? And he said, I am not. Now Jesus had said before the cock crows, before the rooster crows morning, you'll deny me three times. Verse 18. And the servants and officers stood there who had made a fire of coals, for it was coal, and they warmed themselves. And Peter stood with them and warmed himself. And the high priest then asked Jesus of his disciples and of his doctrine. In a court of law, we'd call that a fishing expedition. That's where you get brought in, put under oath, and they try to get, trick you up, get you to say something to, uh, that would incriminate your own self. Verse 20. And Jesus answered him, I spake openly to the world. I ever taught in the synagogues and in the temple, and where the Jews always resort. And in secret have I said nothing. Why ask us thou me? Ask them, your stooges and spies and and investigators that you've been having follow me for the last three years, why askest thou me? Ask them that heard me what I have said unto them. Behold, they know what I've said, and they came back and reported to them. They knew exactly what he had taught. Verse 22. And when he had thus spoken, one of the officers which stood struck Jesus with the palm of his hand, saying, Answer thou the high priest so. And so this shows that an Annas was considered still the high priest. See, the law of Moses, the Old Testament, the high priest served until his death. So once he had been appointed, the Jews didn't consider that the, uh, that the Romans uh, putting him out of office had any effect. Verse 23. And Jesus answered him, If I have spoken evil, bear witness of the evil. But if well, why smitest thou me? Now Annas had sent him bound into Caiaphas, the high priest. Now more than likely, it was just right across the courtyard. It was in the same palace. All he had to do was just walk him right across the courtyard, send him bound into Caiaphas, one side of the palace to the other, verse 25. 
And Simon Peter stood and warned himself. And they said therefore unto him, Art not thou also one of his disciples? And he denied it and said, I am not. And that's twice he's denied now. And one of the servants of the high priest, being his kinsman, whose ear Peter had cut off. Now see here, uh, John confirms the account in Matthew about uh, Peter cutting off the, the high priest's servant's ear, whose ear Peter had cut off, did not, <clears throat> said, did not I see thee with him in the garden? And Peter denied again, and immediately the cock crew. Here we have the testimony of an eyewitness. John was there and saw it all. And immediately the cock crew. John softens the synoptics. The synoptic gospel says that he denied with an oath, and some of them says that he cursed in, uh, in denying him. Verse 28. Then led they Jesus from Caiaphas into the hall of judgment. And it was early, and they themselves went not into the judgment hall, lest they should be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover. Isn't this absolutely amazing? It's a fulfillment of Psalms chapter 22, verse 29, a prophecy written a thousand years before Christ was born. It says, And all they that be fat upon the earth shall eat and worship, what is all the big fat cats in Jerusalem, all the big shots going to be doing that weekend? Well, it's Passover. It's a feast. All they that be fat upon the earth, and that word earth there is the land in the land of Israel. All they that be fat, the big shots in the land of Israel, this weekend of Passover are going to eat. They're going to eat the Passover, and they're going to worship God and what is going to be the result of the death of this Christ? That Psalms goes on and tells us, And all they that go down to the dust of death shall bow before him, and none shall keep alive his own soul. I'm absolutely certain that they had no idea that they uh, would uh, have to go meet Jesus as soon as, as they died. Now notice they didn't go into the judgment hall, uh, that they would be defiled, that they might eat the Passover. These guys are really something, aren't they? They're willing to use false witness testimony to do murder, but unwilling to set foot in a Gentile's house. Now, Pilate obviously knows that. Verse 29. Then Pilate went out to him. Not only did they have to get him up out of bed early in the morning, he's got to go out of his house and go out to see these Jews. And Pilate went out and said to them, What accusation bring ye against this man? Now these Jews are unwilling to submit the real charge. The real charge against this man is that Jesus had testified under oath in Mark 14, verse 61, but he held his peace and answered nothing. And again the high priest asked him and said unto him, Art thou the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? Verse 62. And Jesus said, I am. He testified that he was. And he said, I am. And ye shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Drop down to Revelation 1, 7. It says, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. Even those that pierced him, even the, the people that put him to death, will see him. Back to verse 63, which is an amazing verse. Then the high priest rent his clothes and said, What need we of further witnesses? Now, the high priest is supposed to be a Ph.D. doctor of the law. But in Leviticus chapter 10, verse 6, he is specifically forbidden to do what he just did, tear his own clothes. Now, there's two sons of Aaron who's messed up in Leviticus 10, and they've offered strange fire before the Lord, and fire from God burn them up, in verse 1, now drop down to verse 6. As Moses said to Aaron and to Eleazar and to Ishmael, that's his two surviving sons, his sons, uncover not your heads, neither rend your clothes. 
Notice that. The high priest tore his clothes and said, what need we of further witnesses? And he's specifically forbidden to do that. Neither rend your clothes, lest what? Lest you die, and lest wrath come upon all the people. And wrath certainly came upon the people. Forty years, God gave them a generation. God is so merciful, he gave them 40 more years from 30 A.D. to 70 A.D. before they were destroyed by the Romans. Now back to John 18, verse 30. And he answered and said unto him, If he were not a malefactor, we would not have delivered him up unto thee. Now begins a very interesting thing is the oldest copy of the book of John is called P52, Papyrus 52. It's found in the John Reynolds Library, and it begins right here with John 18, verse 31 through 33, on the uh, front of it, on the recto side. And uh, you can see a copy of P52 right here. And then on the verso, I'll show you when we get to the verso part of it, Now, this was found dated to about 120 A.D. John is dated to about 90. Within 30 years, the Gospel of John has been disseminated all the way to Egypt where P52 was found. Verse 31, Then said Pilate unto them, Take ye him and judge him according to your law. And the Jews therefore said unto him, It is not lawful for us to put any man to death. Aha! Genesis chapter 49, verse 10, a great prophecy of the Old Testament, says the scepter shall not depart from Judah. A scepter is what a king holds in his hand. Judah will always be the kingly tribe. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet. And that term lawgiver means the ability to carry out capital punishment. The king of Judah will always have the authority to say, take that punk out and chop his head off. And man, out he'll go and they'll kill him and there's no appeal, no nothing. The king will always have absolute authority to put people to death until, notice that word until, the scepter shall not depart from Judah nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh comes. Shiloh is to him to whom it belongs. What belongs? Well, him who's really the king. To him who's really Lord of Lord. To him who's really the lawgiver who can send you to hell or give you eternal life, either one. The scepter shall not depart from Judah nor a lawgiver from between his feet till Shiloh comes, binding his foal to a vine and his ass's colt to a choice vine. Jesus had just rode into Jerusalem on the donkey, hadn't he? Verse 32, John 18, verse 32. That the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled which he spake, signifying what death he should die. And in Matthew chapter 20, beginning in verse 17, he says that he's going up to Jerusalem to be crucified of the Gentiles. Had the Jews killed him, they would have stoned him. So he uh, is going up to be uh, crucified. Verse 33. Then Pilate entered to the judgment hall again and called and said unto him, Art thou the king of the Jews? It's obvious that the, uh, they had brought the accusation that he was trying to make himself the secular king of Israel. And that's the accusation that they brought to Pilate, not willing to tell him that he had claimed to be the Son of God, the Messiah. Verse 34. We'd like to encourage our radio audience to go to our website at www.churchofchristpreaching.com. There's a thousand sermons on there, all kinds of written lessons. You can get a college education on there. That's www.churchofchristpreaching.com. For those of you in China, be sure and have a thumb drive. When you go to our, our website, download all the written lessons. You can download all the written lessons onto a zip file because the government of China is monitoring you and they will block you if you attempt to continue. And I hope they don't persecute you. Verse 34. And Jesus answered him, saying, Sayest thou this thing of thyself, or did others tell it thee of me? 
that he was the king of the Jews, in other words. Verse 35, And Pilate answered, Am I Jew? Thy own nation and the chief priests have delivered thee unto me. What hast thou done? And Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered unto the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. So Jesus presents the fact that his kingdom is otherworldly in nature and spiritual in nature rather than physical, and he's no threat to the Roman Empire. Verse 37, And Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Now this is where the reverse of P52 picks up. This is called the reverse side, the verso. Verse 37, Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? And Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. Pilate said unto him, What is truth? And he just terminated the interview right there. And when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said unto them, I find in him no fault at all. This is a second attempt of Pilate to release him. He should have dismissed the case out of hand. Verse 39. But ye have a custom that I should release unto you one at the Passover. Will ye therefore that I release unto you the king of the Jews? Now the third attempt of Pilate to release him. Verse 40. Then cried they all again, saying, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. John chapter 19, verse 1. Then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him, fulfilling Isaiah chapter 53, verse 5, with his stripes we are healed. Now Luke tells us in Luke 23, verse 22, that he wanted to punish him in order to release him. He thought that by scourging him, which was often a death penalty, the scourging had killed most of us. Uh, uh, scourging was done with a Roman flagon, which was a stick about a yard long, and they put three long leather straps on it, and on the end of each one of those straps, they tied a thing, it was made out of metal like a barbell, and the, the uh, leather strap went around it, and it had a big metal end on both ends, and they gave him 39 lashes with this cat of three tails, and those things were designed to bust you up and tear you open. Every place that thing hit him, leave a bruise in a busted place the size of a lemon or so, and it would just tear his back open. And so scourging was often a death penalty in those days. John 19, 1, Then therefore Pilate took Jesus and scourged him. There was a whipping post that was found, that archaeologists found in the Tower of Antonio, uh, which is where the Praetorium was. Verse 2, And the soldiers plaited a crown of thorns and put it upon his head, and they put upon him a purple robe. Now actually it was a tricolored robe. The synoptics tells us that it was scarlet or red robe, and it was like the veil in the temple. The veil in the temple was blue on one side, purple in the middle, and red on the other side. And so uh, Hebrews chapter 10 verse 20 tells us that this is a shadow of that, and by a new and living way which he inaugurated for us through the veil that is his flesh. And of course Matthew tells us in Matthew 27, 51, at the death of Jesus, and behold, the veil in the temple was torn in two from the top and to the bottom. And so, uh, verse 3, And said, Hail, King of the Jews! And they smote him with their hands. Verse 4, And Pilate therefore went forth again and said unto them, Behold, I bring him forth unto you, that you may know that I find no fault in him. Again, he's trying to release him. Five, and then came Jesus forth wearing the crown of thorns and a purple robe. And Pilate said unto him, 
Behold a man. It's like Pilate says, hadn't this man suffered enough? Isn't this enough for you, what you've done to him already? Verse 6. Then the chief priests, therefore, and the officers saw him. They cried out, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. And Pilate said unto them, Take ye him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. You brought no charge against him worthy of death. Do your deed of blood your own self, in other words. Verse 7. And the Jews answered him, We have a law, and by our law he ought to die, because he's made himself the Son of God. Now they tell the real reason that they want him dead, the real reason that they want him murdered, because he made himself, he testified under oath that he was the Son of God. Now, what it really boils down to is that he either was the Son of God or he wasn't. If he wasn't, he got what he had coming. If he was, how you answer that question determines the fate of you throughout all of eternity. Verse 8, Then Pilate therefore heard that saying, He was the more afraid. Pilate had recognized that a wondrous person was before him, somebody unlike any other man he had ever seen. Verse 9, And he went again into the judgment hall, and saith unto Jesus, Whence art thou? But Jesus gave him no answer. His silence was answer enough. He surely would have denied it had he not have said that he was the Son of God. Now, of course, their mythology of the Greeks and the Romans, they believe the gods came down to earth. And so Pilate, that's why he's afraid that this really might be true. This is a wonderful person. And so verse 10, Then said Pilate unto him, Speakest thou not unto me? Knowest thou not I have power to crucify thee and power to release thee? Pilate's almost begging him to give, give me some reason to turn him loose. Isaiah the prophet writing 750 years before Christ was born. In Isaiah 53 verse 7 says he was oppressed and afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He has brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep is dumb before his shears, so he opened not his mouth. Verse 11, And Jesus answered, Thou could have no power at all against me, except it be given thee from above. Therefore he that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. And from thenceforth Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out, saying, If thou let this man go, thou art not Caesar's friend. Whosoever maketh himself a king speaketh against Caesar. A vicious political blackmail. Pilate was a politician. And he wasn't about to lose his power over turning loose somebody that claimed to be a king or king of the Jews. He wasn't about to do that. Verse 13. Then Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus forth and sat down in a judgment seat in a palace that is called the pavement, but in Hebrew, Gabbatha. It's a platform in a praetorium. Verse 14, and it was the preparation of the Passover and about the sixth hour. Now John is writing to the Roman world and so he uses Roman time while the synoptic gospels uses Jew time in, uh, in their timing. So this is about 6 a.m. that he is writing to uh, uh, that Pilate is sit down and it was preparation of the Passover in about the 6 hour, 6 a.m. And he said unto the Jews, Behold your king. And they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. And Pilate said unto them, Shall I crucify your king? And the chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. And crucifying Jesus, they rejected the Father. In 40 years, in A.D. 70, at the destruction of Jerusalem, 30,900 Jews will be crucified hanging on the walls of Jerusalem. Verse 16. Then delivered he him therefore unto them to be crucified. 
And they took Jesus and led him away. He delivered them to the chief priest. Sure, Pilate supplied the centurion and the escort of soldiers, but it was really the Jews that did this to him. I'd like to encourage our radio audience to go to our website at www.churchofchristpreaching.com. There's a thousand sermons on there, and you can uh, get a great education in the Bible. Verse 17. And he bearing his cross went forth to a place, the place of the skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha, because it looks like a skull, and we've got a couple of pictures of it here. This will show you where it was, and Christ was crucified right above that rock there. And here's another picture of it that you can see why they call it the place of the skull. Uh, verse 18 where they crucified him and two others with him on either side, one and Jesus in the midst. And Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross and the writing was Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Now this is an amazing thing. If you read in all four accounts the title you'll see that they do not use a word that's not in the whole title. John leaves out only the words, this is. He uses eight of the ten words. Matthew uses eight of the ten words. Mark only uses the last five words. Luke uses, he only admits Jesus of Nazareth, three words, and so he uses seven of ten. These accounts of eyewitnesses blend perfectly together, each one stating what he remembered when he wrote it. It's an absolute wonderful thing showing the inspiration of Scripture. Verse 19, And Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross, and the writing was, This is Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews, is the full title. This title then read many of the Jews for the place where Jesus was crucified was nine to the city. It was right next to the gates of the city and it was written in Hebrew and Greek and Latin. 21. And said the chief priest of the Jews to Pilate, write not to the king of the Jews, but he said I'm king of the Jews. Here they're back again. Man, like a bad penny, they just keep showing up. Here they're back begging again at Pilate's door. And Pilate's about had enough of this, verse 22. And Pilate answered, what I've written, I've written. 23. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts to every soldier apart. Now the coat was without seam, woven from the top throughout. And they said, let us therefore not rend it, but cast lots for it, whose it shall be. That the scripture might be fulfilled, it said, they parted my raiment among them, and for my vestures they, they cast lots. These things, therefore, the soldiers did. In Psalms chapter 22, verse 18, says, And they parted my vesture among them, and they parted my garments among them, and for my vesture did they cast lots. If you go back to verse 16, you'll see in Psalms 22, verse 16, that they have pierced my hands and my feet. This is written 1,000 B.C. Crucifixion won't be invented until 500 B.C. This is like a, a prophecy of the electric chair before electricity is ever invented. It's an amazing thing. Verse 25. And now there stood it to cross Jesus... Uh, the cross of Jesus, his mother, and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Cleophas, and Mary Magdalene. 26. Then Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom Jesus loved, John. He said unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. From that hour, he assumed responsibility for Mary. Verse 28. And after this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. In Psalms chapter uh, 22, verse 15, 
It says, my strength is dried up like a potsherd. My tongue cleaveth to my jaws, and thou hast brought me into the dust of death. God had said, for dust thou art, and dust thou shalt return. And Jesus was brought to death, to the very dust of death, so that he might conquer death for all men who will have him. Verse 29. And now there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled the sponge with vinegar, and put it upon hyssop, and put it to his mouth. In Psalm 69, verse 21 They gave me also gall for my meat. Matthew's account says that when just before his crucifixion, they offered him gall, which is half wine and half opium. They offered him gall. He refused the gall. Now at the end of his crucifixion, he says, I thirst. And Psalms 22, uh, excuse me, Psalms 69, 21. They gave me gall for my meat and my thirst. They gave me vinegar to drink. And when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said it is finished, and he bowed the head and gave up the ghost. This vinegar was a thin, sour wine, and uh, when he put it to his mouth with hyssop, which is a, uh, a reed of the capper plant, about three or four foot long, then he died, then he gave up the ghost. Verse 31. And the Jews, therefore, because it was a preparation that the bodies should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, it was Thursday, April 6th, uh, 30 A.D., Kaufman says, and I tend to agree with him, for that Sabbath day was a high day, besought Pilate that their legs might be broken, that they might be taken away. He died at the very time that the Passover lambs were being sacrificed in the temple. And the first thing that John the Baptist saw about him when he saw him, he said, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. Verse 32. Then came the soldiers and brake the legs of the first and of the other which was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they brake not his legs. In Psalms chapter 34, verse 20, says, He keepeth all his bones, not one of them will be broken. Verse 34, And one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith there came out blood and water. Verse 35, And he that saw bear record. And so John is used the perfect tense verb here, indicating that he's talking about himself. In other words, without using the word I, in order to be humble, without using the word I, he bears witness, and he, John, that saw it, bear record, and his record is true, and he knoweth that uh, what he saith is true, and the reason that he wrote it is that ye might believe. Verse 36. For these things were done that the scripture should be fulfilled. The bone of him shall not be broken. Again, that was Psalms 34, 20. He keepeth all his bones, not one of them will be broken. Verse 37. And again, another scripture saith, they shall look upon him whom they have pierced. In Zechariah chapter 12, verse 20, it says, And I will pour upon the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and of supplication. God, 400 years before Christ, looks through history and puts together Passover and Pentecost. I will pour upon the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit, what he's going to do at uh, Pentecost 50 days later, the spirit of grace and of supplication, and they shall look upon me, God. When did, when did the Jews ever pierce their God? When they had him hanging on that cross and they had the Roman soldiers do it. They shall look upon me whom they have pierced and mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and be in bitterness as one is bitterness for his firstborn. Verse 38. And after this, Joseph of Arimathea, Matthew says he's a rich man, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, 
besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him leave, and he came therefore and took the body of Jesus. And there came also Nicodemus, which at the first came to Jesus by night in John 3, and brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pound weight. Boy, this was really expensive. This cost a lot of money. Verse 40. And they took the body of Jesus and wound it in linen clothes with the spices as is the manner of the Jews to bury. Yet by reading the synoptic uh, Gospels in John, we see plainly that they laid out a long garment like a sheet, laid Jesus on it, folded it back over him, over the top of him, then took strips of cloth and tied it around him that they could use to carry him with. And so this is how Jesus was bound with some of those spices inside the uh, burial shroud and some out. Uh, <clears throat> verse 41. And now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new sepulcher, wherein never man yet lay. 42. There laid they Jesus, therefore, because of the Jews' preparation day, for the sepulcher was nigh at hand. Chapter 20, verse 1. The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early, when it was yet dark unto the sepulcher, and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulcher. Then she runneth and come to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and said unto them, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher, and we know not where they have laid him. And Peter therefore went forth and that other disciple and came to the sepulcher. And so they ran both together and the other disciple did outrun Peter and came first to the sepulcher. That's exactly what you'd expect of John being a younger man. I mean, William could beat me to the street out here, I guarantee you, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to out race him. Verse 5, And he stooped down, and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying, and he went, yet went he not in. He saw this cocoon of grave clothes, just like Jesus rose through them. And it had the same effect on John as if he'd have seen that walking. Then come a Simon Peter following him and went into the sepulcher and seeing the linen clothes rise. And so Jesus rose through, bodily through, a great miracle through these linen clothes. Verse 7. And the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a separate place. 8. Then went in also that other disciple which came first to the sepulcher, and he saw and believed. This is a climax of the whole paragraph. John tells us the very minute that he first believed in the resurrection of Jesus, when he saw this cocoon and Jesus having risen through it. Verse 9. For as yet they knew not the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Now, Jesus had repeatedly prophesied of his death and burial and resurrection, but they thought it was figurative and not literal. Verse 10. And then the disciples went away into their own home. But Mary stood without at the sepulcher, weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulcher. 12, and seeing two angels in white sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had laid. And they said unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? And she said unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. 14, and when she had, said, <clears throat> had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing and knew not that it was Jesus. Her eyes were full of tears. Knew not that it was Jesus. 15. Jesus said to her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? And she, supposing him to be the gardener, saith unto him, Sir, if thou hast brought him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. 16. And Jesus said to her, Mary, 
and she turned herself and saith to him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master, 17. And Jesus saith to her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father, but I go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend to my Father and your Father and my God and your God. 18. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples what she had seen and the Lord and that he had spoken these things unto her. And then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, Sunday, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, they're scared to death because of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and said unto them, Peace be unto you. Now remember this, he's going to say it twice, and we're going to pick up there in the synoptics in a minute. Peace be unto you, verse 20. And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. 21. Then said Jesus unto them again, Peace be unto you. As my Father has sent me, even so send I you. 22. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. He gave them a measure of the Holy Spirit, and we're going to find out what measure that was in just a minute in Luke's account. But he gave them a measure prior to Pentecost, prior to them being baptized in the Holy Spirit. He gave them a measure of the Holy Spirit that they might understand the Scriptures. Verse 23. Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. He's simply saying, if you don't get the job done, it's not going to be done. If you don't go to Greece, there won't be any Greek people saved. If you don't go to Italy, there won't be any people in Italy saved. If you don't go to North Africa, there won't be anybody there saved. You've got to get the job done And how do you remit their sins? Well, by them coming to God in the appointed way, as we see. And so note that clause again, peace be unto you in verse 19 and 21. Now we're going to go to Luke chapter 24, verse 33. And they arose up the same hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven gathered together and them that were with them saying, The Lord is risen indeed, and has appeared unto Simon. And they told what things were done in the way, and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. Verse 36, And as they thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them, and said unto them, Peace be unto you. Now this is the same time that John is talking about. Peace be unto you. Verse 37, But they were terrified and affrighted and supposed that they had seen a spirit. And he said unto them, Why are you troubled and why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, it is I myself handle me. And see, for a spirit has not flesh and bones as you see me have. Notice he doesn't say anything about blood. It might be because he poured all his own blood out, huh? In Acts chapter 1, verse 3, it says about the apostles, to whom he showed himself alive by many infallible proofs. What are those infallible proofs? Well, he tells us right here. Behold my hands, my feet, as I myself handled me, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as you see me have. He's not a hank. He didn't rise in the heart of his disciples. He arose bodily. He could be touched. He was not a vision. He was not a spirit. He was not a dream. He rose. He conquered death for all of us, if you'll have him. Verse 40. And when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they yet believed not for joy and wondered, he said unto them, Have you here any meat? And they gave him a piece of boiled fish and of honeycomb. And he took it and did eat before them. Ghosts don't eat. They eat, it falls right out of them, doesn't it? Ghosts don't eat. You can't touch and feel and handle ghosts. 
Verse 44. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. This is what we're going to study this coming year. The prophecies of Jesus will begin in just a few weeks. Verse 45. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. The Greek here would indicate that he got his point across. This is the point that he breathed on them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. They now have this measure of the Holy Spirit that they could finally understand the scriptures. He finally got his point across. Verse 46. And he said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it proved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. Where is that written? Well, it's found in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 8, 9, and 10. In verse 8, he's killed. In verse 9, he's buried. In verse 10, God prolongs his days. How in the world can that happen? That's written 750 years before Christ was born. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Verse 47. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in His name among all nations. What are we to preach? Repentance. Repent means change your mind. Godly sorrow worketh repentance. Be sorry for your sins. That repentance and remission of sins should be preached in His name among all nations beginning in Jerusalem. Did Peter do his job on the day of Pentecost? The men cried to him, men and brethren, what shall we do? Acts 2.37, and he said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Verse 48, you're witnesses of these things. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem till ye be endued with power or clothed with power from on high. Verse 50. Then he led them out as far into Bethany and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And it came to pass while he was blessing them, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven and they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. How you deal with this gospel is going to determine where you spend eternity. The Bible teaches us the gospel is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning in verse 1, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, verse 3, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and it arose again the third day according to the Scriptures. If you believe that gospel, there's no reason for you to be lost. You can just march right down to the front down here and make confession that you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. You can repent of your sins, confess Christ as Lord, be baptized into Christ, and have all your sins washed away. Won't you come now while we stand and sing? Amen.